Well, the first thing I believe people do with assessing a leader is essentially say, is this person authentic? Is this person real? Do I trust this person? In the end, trust is the ultimate human currency. So the way I live it was always to have the humility to recognize my success will be based on choosing the absolute very best people. And I often told them, I choose to do what I do well often. I don't choose to do what I don't do so well at all. That's what you do. So you have to show them right away that you need them. And the best leaders always hire the best people. Welcome to the Follow My Lead podcast, where we transfer stories and best practices of today's leaders to the leaders of tomorrow with your host, John Eads. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Follow My Lead podcast. I'm your host, John Eads. You can find me on social media at John G. Eads. This week's guest honestly doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. Bill McDermott is the CEO and a member of the executive board of SAP, the world's business software market leader with approximately 320,000 customers in 190 countries. He leads the company's nearly 80,000 employees and more than 2 million person ecosystem in executing SAP's vision and strategy to make the world run better and improve people's lives. He's also the author of Winner's Dream, A Journey from the Corner Store to the Corner's Office. He is so passionate about sharing his professional story to help others, so we were so excited to have him on the show. We talked about why it's so important to have a dream, what one bit of advice he would give every single modern professional, why having a purpose, strategy, and vision is so important for any leader. He spoke at length about work-life balance and what he thought was harder, leading at work or leading at home. I think his answer really might surprise you. Uh, this interview was probably one of the highlights of my professional career, so so get out your pen or pad, pull out Evernote, and do your best to take in some of these lessons, capture them so you can remember them for a long period of time. So without further ado, here's my conversation with the one and only Bill McDermott. Just a quick housekeeping item. This podcast is brought to you by LearnLoft, a professional development company focused on providing education that delivers value for the modern professional. Check out their online leadership programs, blogs, resources, and podcasts at LearnLoft.com. Their brand new 10-day leadership challenge program is set to be released this week, filled with leadership videos, challenges, and social interactions to help you become a better leader in just 10 days. Well, Bill, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate it. John, great to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, there's there's a there's only a few people in my life that I can say with certainty made a really big impact in a short amount of time, and one of those guys is you. When I read Winner's Dream, it was like you wrote it for me. Now, I know you didn't write it for me, Bill. <laughs> Why did you write it? Where does it come from? Where did where did writing that book, why did you do it? Well, you know, it's really interesting you should say that because I really did write it for you, John. I tried to uh, tell the story how I lived it, and I tried to put it into a context that was straight from the heart because I had spoken with literally thousands of people in my professional journey um, but even more, thousands of students around the world. And what I found was they were all interested in the real stories, how it actually happened, the interactions, uh, the determination and grit that came from how I actually lived my life. And they used to tell me at the end of all the discussions, you got to write a book, you should write a book. <laughs> and then finally I said, you know what, I think I've heard that enough times that maybe I should write a book. And what I learned is, you know, so many people get great educations and they live in the world of academia, um, but they don't necessarily get the real authentic voice of the street. So what I try to do is bridge the gap between what you get in the classroom and maybe what you get when you get your first job or you climb, climb in the ladder, but maybe I just give it to you in a way that's just so authentic and, and so from the gut that people say, you know, I can learn something from this guy and I can learn something from Winner's Dream and that story. And therefore, John, I, I really did write it for you and uh, all of your followers. Well, 
it, it was just a fantastic, the idea of kind of where you came from um, to, you know, from all the way to the corner office at one of the largest software companies in the world. Where does, where does that, is there anything in that journey that stands out to you that a, a young professional could really learn from that you, that you just, if you could impart one bit of wisdom on anybody that are, is doubting themselves or has fear around where they're going to be in their professional career, what would that one piece of advice be? Well, if you think about um, the quote I put in the book kind of right out of the gates is some people see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? And of course, that's the immortal words of uh, Robert Kennedy himself. But the idea was simply to say, we're all entitled to a dream. And when you have a dream and you believe strongly enough in the dream, Nobody can take that away from you. So as I reflect back on that corner store and trading in three part-time jobs for one full-time job, that ultimately led me to buy my first business as a teenage entrepreneur, I remember what it really took. And what it really took is this incredible empathy for other people, this incredible empathy to be in service other people. In that case, it was your customers. I had basically three market segments. You know, one was the senior citizen, two was the blue collar worker like my dad, and three was the high school kids. And my store was right between two large conglomerates. One was finest supermarket and the other was 7-Eleven. And what I learned is the little one has to do what the big one is either unwilling to do or structurally unable to do. So if I wanted to attract the senior citizens from the condominium complex a block down the road, I realized quickly, they want delivery. They don't want to leave the house. I delivered, the others didn't. When I thought about the blue collar workers, they were flush rich on Friday night and they were broke by Sunday morning. And I could relate to that. I lived that life. So I gave them credit and they always paid me back. But the hard part was how do I get those high school kids to walk a block and a half past 7-Eleven to my store when 7-Eleven was so close. Well, I go down there and I see them 40 at a time online, only four in the store. And I ask the kids, why you all waiting out here when there's a big store in there? (laughs) And they said, well, they think we're going to take things. I said, don't worry about all that. Come down to my store. So I built them a video game room. I just saw what was working at the mall. And those kids plucked quarters in those machines all day. We gave them good food, and I let them in 40 at a time. And one of the kids said, you know, to underscore this customer empathy, they said, when I want good food to be treated with respect and play video games, I come to your store. And when I want to steal stuff, I go to (laughs) 7-Eleven. So it was really the whole idea of just understanding that if that customer doesn't walk through that door and spend time and invest in my business, I don't make payroll I can't stock those shelves, and certainly I can't pay for my college education. So it was a real win-win-win. The ideas came to you know, a new form because others weren't doing it. The customer was winning, and ultimately myself and the workers that counted on me to come up with an idea or two uh, were able to earn a living, and that's real simple. Yeah, and you you seem to take that same mentality, Bill, from that that corner store to now one of the largest software companies in the world um and and that customer that empathy that you just mentioned it seems from the outside perspective that you have both that for your sap customer but also for your employees do you look at your customer and your employee the same and should should or should leaders look at them differently Well, I think you have to look at all people the same and really respect the fact that diversity of people and thinking about people in diverse ways helps you be a better servant leader. Because in the end, you know, when I determine the vision for SAP as an example, I essentially, with the help of my colleagues, said, what is our higher purpose? 
You know, why are we here? Why do we matter? And we said, well, our, our role is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. So there would be an economic impact of what we did, of course. But in society, we could actually improve economies. We could help companies help their customers and achieve their goals. And ultimately, we could also help the sustainability of our planet by coming up with new ways to make things more efficiently, do less harm to the environment, and create a virtuous cycle. So I think the first thing you have to have is a purpose that both touches your customer and your people because you're playing for bigger stakes than just commerce. And the second thing, you know, that I, I thought about in that regard is the strategy. Your strategy, you know, leaders will be forgiven for a lot of mistakes. We all make them. But you'll never be forgiven for a bad strategy. And guess what? That's both the customer and the employee because the customer relies on you to come up with things in your strategy that really enables their strategy. And the people know firsthand that if your strategy doesn't help the customer win, ultimately it'll fail. And who's responsible for that? Well, the guy in the corner office. So therefore, that corner store to corner office is a perfect way to put in a tight capsule what the journey's actually been all about. How do you, uh, how do you get people employees to get on board or buy into that vision and that strategy and that purpose. I'm sure over the course of your career, you've run across people that just don't see it your way, or they just don't mm-hmm. think it's, it's, that is the correct future for XYZ company or for SAP or for anybody. What do you do in such a situation? Well, the first thing I believe people do with assessing a leader is essentially say, is this person authentic? Is this person real? Do I trust this person? In the end, trust is the ultimate human currency. So the way I live it was always to have the humility to recognize my success will be based on choosing the absolute very best people. And I often told them, I choose to do what I do well often. I don't choose to do what I don't do so well at all. That's what you do. So you have to show them right away that you need them. And the best leaders always hire the best people. And they know that the people they hire are better than them. That's what the mark of a good leader is, to be self-secure, to know that the people you hire are better than you. The second thing is, They want somebody who's hungry, you know, and passionate about what they do for a living and lays it on the line each and every day. So you have to be that living example, that embodiment of what you preach. You have to live it, show it, and absolutely role model it in everything that you do. And then I think you start to develop this uncanny ability to create followership. You know, one of the things I see in young leaders is they try to be somebody that they're not because they think they have to make up for the years of inexperience or the things that they don't know by emulating or imitating somebody else, which is the wrong strategy. Mm -hmm. Just be you. The best part of you is you. And people know what we're good at and what we're not good at, but if they know you are you, it gives them the permission to be themselves. And then everybody's on an authentic page of trust. And that really is the precursor to any, any really, really great organization. You know, in the book, I talk about my first interview with Xerox. And, you know, what did I know about copy machines and electronic appliances coming out of a delicatessen business? Probably not too much, but I did know that the day my dad took me to that Long Island Railroad to ride into New York City, and I had just left my home with my $99 suit, and I had to have my brother pick me up on the fifth step from the bottom of the second floor because we had four and a half feet of water in the house on that day. Because every time we got a high tide or a northeast storm, my house flooded. I knew that I came 
from humble beginnings, but I also knew that I had a dream in my heart. And so when my dad dropped me off at the railroad track, I basically, you know, got out of the car and I said, Dad, I guarantee I'm coming home tonight with my employee badge in my pocket. And he said, Bill, you're a good guy. Don't put all that pressure on yourself. Just do the best you can. And I said, hey, Dad, I guarantee it. I go up to the top uh, on the escalator to get onto the train. I read the annual report about the reinvention of Xerox under something called total quality management. Because at that time, Xerox was actually building machines at a higher price than the offshore competition was selling their machines. And by the way, the offshore competition's machines were actually more reliable at that time. So that's an incredible business challenge. By the time I got to New York, I was fired up about helping solve that problem. I thought I could be a catalyst getting behind that CEO's vision. I get into the hiring center, John, and there's all these young people, graduates of very prestigious schools, beautifully groomed, obviously, a little bit more polished than this kid coming from Long Island, seeing all this for the first time. And I'm thinking to myself, I might have overstated it a little bit with my dad. This <laughs> could be a tough day. But you know what I did, John? I just basically said, what am I good at? I don't want to try to be them. I can't be them. What I was good at is I had 500 people come into the store a day buying stuff. And I would start a conversation with every one of them. I had empathy for them because they were incredibly important in my life. I needed my customers. So I basically just said, okay, I'm going to start talking with these young people. Hey, what are you in for? What are you trying to accomplish? What's your goals? How do you feel about Xerox? And I would get answers like, well, I'm playing the field. I'm interviewing with Goldman. I'm interviewing with IBM. We'll see what happens. Merrill's talking to me too. And I said, wow, this was the moment I realized that it was my day because I wanted it so much more than they did. I wasn't playing the field. I was there to get my dream job. And I'll never forget going into the final interview with Emerson Fullwood in the corner office of 9 West 57th overlooking Central Park on the 38th floor, sitting down, having an amazing interview with him. And as I'm there, I realized this wasn't an interview. I was in a fight for my life because if I get this job on this day, I can control my own destiny. I can pursue my dream. And if I don't, who knows? Right. So I took it with everything I had. We get to the end of the interview. He said to me, so Bill, uh, been a great interview. Thank you very much. The HR department will get in touch with you in a couple of weeks. To which I reply, Mr. Fullwood, I don't think you completely understand the situation, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he tilts that. He looks at me and he's like, well, you know, what is this kid talking about? And I said, you know, the reason is I haven't broken a promise to my father in 21 years. And I guaranteed him I was coming home with my employee badge in my pocket tonight. I say nothing else. He tilts the head a little bit more. And he said, Bill McDermott, as long as you haven't committed any crimes, you're hired. And I said, well, Mr. Fullwood, I certainly haven't committed any crimes. So I just want to test my understanding here. You, you're <laughs> saying I'm hired as long as I haven't, right? And he goes, yeah. You know, so I bear hug him and walk him around in the air a little bit, put him down, and then, you know, make my way to the corner of uh, 57th Street and 6th Avenue. By the way, you had to put quarters in phones then, John, call up my mom and dad. And I said, you know, break out the core bell. Yeah. You know, we got the job. We're coming home to celebrate. So, you know, what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is you got the humility, you got the hunger, you got the dream, and you're wearing your authentic self on your sleeve. You know, he might have thought it was a careful or a well-planned line, but I was just telling the truth. Yeah. Well, you know, before, before I've had a chance to speak to quite a few of your your team members at SAP, and the one thing I hear consistently, Bill, is that you are who you say you are. You know, so often you meet people, they write about, they they talk about, but then when you actually meet them in real life or you interact with them on a regular basis, you're like, this man or woman just isn't what they say they are. And as someone that 
is an outsider to SAP, I have to say, of all five or six people that I've talked to with an SAP, the message is consistent. This guy does and says and lives out what he preaches. And I think there's a lesson right there for young professionals is that, you know, you have from an outsider, you have every reason to not be humble, to not be thinking about other people, to not be thinking about your employees. And what do you do? The opposite. Um, and I, I think it's a real credit to you and your journey. And and you mentioned something else that, Bill, I want to touch on. You talked about trust um, and how important mm-hmm. trust is as a leader. How do you earn trust? Or do you do you, do you start even to take that a step further do you start at a hundred percent with new people or do you start at zero well if i could john i I give you a couple of examples um the answer is you have to give trust unconditionally before you can get trust humans have enormous instinctual power and they know who's the real deal and they might especially with a young kid. I mean, when I was 21, I'm sure a lot of people were like, is it real? Is he who he says he is? Is that really, can that that energy, that lightning in a bottle, can that be true? And I could have spent my whole career just basically explaining to them, you don't have any idea how badly I want it. And that would have taken too much time. So I just determined myself to show them who I was each and every day and let time take care of itself. Because if you're consistently the same thing each and every day for enough years, even the naysayers have to say, he's different, but he is who he is. <laughs> and, that, and that's, and that's, and that's kind of how I lived it. So I'll give you a couple of examples that, you know, one is like sort of a tactical example that I think people might find interesting. And, and another one might be a little bit more strategic. So tactically, you know, you get the dream job, right? I'm knocking on cold doors for a living. So I was a door to door salesman at 21 selling copy machines, electronic typewriters, facsimile machines, uh, things like that. So we get this lead to go to a brownstone in Manhattan. I got this copy machine on my back. I got an electronic typewriter in one hand and a briefcase loaded up with brochures in another hand. I'm in that same $99 suit. It's 95 degrees in the shade in Manhattan. We get a lead to go to a brownstone. Of course, I'm the mule going out traveling with the senior guy, which is why I'm carrying all the heavy gear, right? right you're like the a, kid's going to yeah. do the hard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're like in, so a, I get, in, in, you're in NFL camp. They, they got you carrying the pads. Yeah. You, you got it, you know, clipboard and all. So I get to the brownstone, no elevator. You got to walk up, um, flights of stairs. I get to the top, and all of a sudden I look in the room, and there's this amazing woman who's obviously the CEO of the company, like decked out in the Chanel suit in the beautiful brownstone in Manhattan. And I'm like, you know, just seeing her make an eye contact as the sweat pours down the side of my cheek, this huge cat jumps onto my $99 suit and sticks its claws through my suit and into my skin. I wasn't that worried about the skin because that stuff will heal, but I was sure worried about those nails coming out of that $99 suit, what it might look like (laughs) after I got that cat off me. But the main thing was, okay, this is a moment. What do you do? Of course you do the right thing. The right thing is just to hold the cat. I don't want the cat to fall. You don't have a scene. And I pet the cat. Love the cat. Good kitty. And the woman looks over at me and she said, wow, you really, really like animals. And I said, especially cats. <laughs> and, and especially this cat. You know, you know, Garfield has nothing on this cat. Right. And so I basically, you know, dropped the typewriter in the briefcase and... Stay with the cat. And what's amazing about an authentic moment like that is is reading the room. It's obvious if it's just her and the cat. She's the CEO, and the cat's the president of the company. And that cat really matters. So instead of trying to be something you're not, or instead of trying to push 
the story on the copying machine. You react. You read the situation. You react to the situation. We have this wonderful conversation. At the end of it, you know, the senior guy says, hey, aren't you going to plug in the machine and do the demo, kid? And I asked the woman, do you really need to see a demo? I mean, you take a copying machine, the green button, hit start, and makes a copy. The electronic typewriter looks like the one over there, the keyboard, only it's fast because it's electronic. Would you like them? And, uh, you know, how many would you like? <laughs> and she said, oh, I don't need to see a demonstration. And she goes, I'll take two of them. So we fill out the order agreement. I said, press real hard, keep the third copy, and we're on our way. And the whole thing was reading the room. So tactically... Staying true and authentic to who you are. Reading the room, just like you did with the 500 people that came into the deli each day. Dealing with each individual situation without canned answers and canned behaviors makes you who you are. And all you need to do is be true to that. The other story I would give you is I go to Puerto Rico. I had been with um, Xerox now um, for probably the better part of uh, uh, nine years. And I get an opportunity, newly married with a brand new baby, um, to go to Puerto Rico to run Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Now, what was interesting about that situation is Puerto Rico was ranked 67 out of 67. (laughs) They were dead last. So, you know, some people might say, you know, is this a compliment or a curse? Because I'm getting the worst performing organization. So, of course, I go, I scout it out. And I feel very good about the people and the opportunity. And I tell my wife, you know, let's pack up. We're going to Puerto Rico. So here's the key. For the first two weeks, I did nothing but listen to the people and met with the people, asked them questions. Questions like, how have you all been so consistently bad? What is it that's driving that? (laughs) You know, why are you guys dead last? And you've been consistently dead last. So you, you, you obviously figured out a science around it. <laughs> and I really wanted to understand what was really going on. Because the thing that you have to understand as a leader is what is the root cause of the result, not the result itself. And in the end, I learned that basically the people wanted leadership. They wanted a vision they could believe in. And they wanted to be motivated each and every day they went to work. And most importantly, they wanted to celebrate their Christmas party again because the other guy was a cross cutter and took away their Christmas party. So after I had assessed the situation, I came in one day and we do this meeting and I said, look, here's the vision. We're going to give the customer something that they've never had before. Each and every day, we're going to come in here with extreme levels of professionalism, extreme accountability, and we are going to drive this business forward. And we're not only going to be pretty good at what we do, we're going to be the number one business in the entire world. So we go from 67 to number one. Well, yeah, I no sooner said that, then all the oxygen left the room. And the people felt like, I guess, you know, this guy will be on his way back to New York City pretty soon because that's a goal we can't hit. But then I also reminded them that they're getting their Christmas party back. And I hired the number one salsa singer in Puerto Rico, Hilbertito Santa Rosa, and I booked the El San Juan Hotel, and we were going to celebrate like champions. But we had to be number one. And you know what? I could see the little spark. And I basically said to them, look, let's take it one day at a time. Let's take it one week at a time, one month at a time, one quarter at a time. You trust me, I trust you. And we work together. And we will this thing to happen. Well, we came out of that first quarter improving the stack ranking. Second quarter, same thing. Third quarter, we were like the the horse that could, you know, kind of like Seabiscuit running around to the finish line. And then that year, we finished number one and beat everybody and come in as the top performing organization in the company. Now, what's beautiful about that story and this authenticness and this trust is I went back there more than 20 years later to a dimly lit restaurant on a Sunday night because I had a business function function the next day and they say to me, Bill, we really wanna have an opportunity 
to come to your business function the next day, but maybe a couple of us can stop by and we can have, you know, a drink or a little bit of a dinner. I figured three or four people would show up. Well, lo and behold, the place was packed. Yeah. They had booked it out, the whole thing. And what I realized is two decades had passed, but the friendship, the trust, the authenticity, and what we accomplished together, it was like it was yesterday. And that's why I try to remind people that it's all about the people. It's all about the team. It's all about the trust. It's all about the dream. And it's all about willing the dream to happen each and every day because realistically, none of us is as smart or as motivated or as passionate as all of us. And when you can put that together, you absolutely create things that endure the test of time. Well, it's a beautiful story. I mean, the long-term Think of the long-term um, impact that you had on those people. Um, long after you're gone, that impact will be felt, and I think that's the real beauty of leadership. Um, so it's a tremendous story, and I, I thank you for sharing it. I know we're short on time. I do want to ask you uh, – I have two two questions I really like to ask. That is, what's harder, leading at home or leading at work? Well, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, I have always tried to create a life where I was in a state of work life. And what I mean by that is I never looked at work as an imposition on my home life or my home life as an imposition on my work life. I tried to be the same human being in both circumstances. So when I am home, I am dad, I am husband, I am brother, I am son, I am friend. But that human being is the same guy that they get to see in the office. And I think somehow along the way, people got confused that it had to be two different people and there had to be this um, brick wall in between both lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So what I really think you have to do is when you're in the midst of family time, you have to be totally focused on family time. And similarly, when you're in the midst of work, you have to be fo totally focused on work. But you also have to realize the interdependent nature of them. So some people say, for example, you know, work and, work and family balance, how do you do it? Um, do you shut off the um, uh, iPhone on the weekend? You know, the answer is no. I, I, I am digitally connected at all times because I want to be. And I choose my digital time carefully because by being connected and being a real time person, I can be in both movies with my whole heart and soul without interruption when they require that total focus. But yet at the same time, I'm not ever far away from the other part, which is whether I'm home, I should know what's going on at work or whether I'm at work, I should know what's going on at home. Right. And the other thing is, the other thing is this, you know, if you sit down at the table, you know, a lot of the conversation is not about like, what am I doing in the office? But as your kids get older, they become more and more interested and the dialogue becomes more and more rich around what does it take? Um, what are some of the things that you encounter? How can I learn? What can you, in, you know, in, in, inspire in me as I go through this challenge in school? or I have this difficult exam, or I have this tough teacher, or I can't make this relationship work with this group of kids. And, and what, you, what you realize pretty quickly is people are people, life is life. A lot of the issues that are relevant in the office are also relevant at home. But I will also say to you, you know, there does need to be a line drawn. And in the end, there's no priority more important than being a husband and a father and a person that never ever shortchanged the birthdays, the meaningful experiences, and the things that matter most in life, which is always family. But I also don't want to um, leave out the fact that a lot of the things that you're able to do for your family came because you realized that you work family was also very much a part of your family. And you could never be a success. You could never give your family the things that you want to give them 
if you don't love your work family also, and they're not a meaningful part of your heart and your soul, not just your mind. So I think that is really an important distinction, and I hope that in some way leaders really get that, because I really feel this idea of these walls and these different people that people try to think they have to be um, to be good at something is just an illusion. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, it was, it was very well said. Now I do have to give you a little critique. I'm not sure you gave me an answer, Bill. I'm, I'm not sure what's, what's just harder leading at home or leading at the office. Are they equal? Uh, no, I think leading at home is harder. Um, <laughs> if I had to give you a direct answer. And I say that, and I say that because, um, as you are a leader of consequence, and all the experiences that you accumulate over the years, you understand how to deal with the challenges of uh, capital markets, strategies, work visions, different circumstances around um, people management issues and so forth, and competition. You, you really do become quite skilled at that. Most of the time, the issues that can really throw you a curveball at home are ones that are brand new. Right. They happen for the first time. Um, the, the, the stakes are the highest possible stakes, mm -hmm. and therefore they are harder. Um, they are more gut-wrenching. They are more consequential, and there is a level of detail and uh, heart-wrenching emotion that you you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. Um, whether that's helping your kids be the best that they can be, whether that's losing a loved one, um, the challenges that lead up to that are ultimately, you know, how you're confronted with that and, and how you can possibly get through the most difficult circumstances and fully recover and be what you were before. Uh, those are just unbelievably difficult. And I think what's what makes that easily the harder part is – it's a it's a segment of one. It all it all it's happening. It didn't happen before, and you're dealing with it for the first time. And it's it's everything. Yeah. Well, Bill, you, you're an exceptional example to professionals everywhere. Not only not only in the U.S. but all over the world. I mean, being a global company and sharing your story, sharing you know even as as, as tug on the heartstrings as that was with with leading at home and leading at work. I mean, it's just your tremendous example. We thank you for not only being on, but, but being the example that others can look up to and try to emulate. And I know SAP is very lucky to have you with another strong second quarter and, and another strong first half of the year. So we, we thank you very much, Bill. Well, well John, I, I really can't thank you enough uh, for your kind words and also for having me. And I hope in, uh, in some way, um, the way I lived it is helpful um, to your followers. And for those of you out there that might be listening to this, um, just remember, we're all a work in progress. And every day, we just got to constantly keep reinventing what we brought from yesterday and keep dreaming about what we can be tomorrow. And that's why winners have to dream. So thanks again, John. Absolutely, Bill. We'll, talk, we'll, uh, we'll, keep, we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. Right, bye. I hope you enjoyed another episode of the Follow My Lead podcast. It's a real honor and pleasure to bring you stories and best practices to help you perform better at work and at home. You can continue to educate yourself at learnloft.com. There's free resource section as well as old podcast episodes, blogs, and even a free trial of our Getting Leadership Ready program as well as our High Performance Leadership program to help you perform better at work. Until next time. Remember, you don't need permission to lead.